Um, since I forgot to talk about type, let's go ahead and, and do that. Make sure that you have your properties panel up. Very important. And to use the type tool, you just click on the key. And let me move my properties panel up for a minute so you can see. By default, it should probably be set to static text, and that's what we're going to be using for quite a while. There's also dynamic text, and there's input text. Static text is just what the, the term implies. It's just there. Um, <coughs> you have at your fingertips with static text all of the fonts that are available on your computer. And what it does, since now I think most computers use TrueType, when it exports the file as an SWF file, it only sends the outlines. It does, you don't have to have the font on your computer at home in order to see it. That's not true when we get to designing web pages with HTML. Okay, That's not true at all. There's just a handful of, of, of fonts or groups of fonts that you should or can use because they have to be ex, um, available on the end user's computer in order to view them. Does that make sense? What you're looking at in Flash when you see the type is just an outline of it. You're not seeing the editable text. You're seeing the, the full-blown version. Or, or just, what am I saying? In Flash, you're, just seeing, you're not seeing the editable text. You're just seeing an outline or an image of it. So it's no longer editable. When you select text in here, you can, if you wish, <coughs> you can also restrict it to device fonts. So you, you only have the fonts that are available to the end user, if you wish. And sometimes that will reduce the time it takes to download. Okay. You can also specify, you can see here, you can specify bitmap text so there's no anti-aliasing. That looks horrible, so I would not use that. You can also, and this is a useful tool too, use anti-aliasing for animation. So when you know you're going to animate the text, it will adjust it a little bit so that the animation of the text looks a little smoother. Yep. <coughs> okay, anti-aliasing blends the image to the background, as it were. And this is probably a, a crude way of describing it. <coughs> Let me, I think it's easiest if I show you an example and then do it, do it that way. So I'm going to go ahead and say bitmap text. <coughs> and I'm going to click T and I'm just going to create a big O, okay, capital O. And I think I'm going to highlight this and I'm going to make it black so you can see it a little better. See all the jaggies around the edge? <coughs> I go ahead over here and I view this a little bit larger. I'll just view it 200%. Not look, it doesn't look too good, does it? <coughs> In order to create the type, it's using little pixels. So it, if you've ever tried to draw with a piece of grid, you know, a, a grid paper, when you look around the edge, and that's what we're doing here, it's not a, a, a nice smooth transition, is it? It's a little jaggy. You see those individual steps. Well, what anti-aliasing does is it helps bridge between that, and it, and it smooths it. So you'll see a, a, a slight grayscale or a transition from the image to the background, or vice versa, or the image to another image, so on and so forth. So you'll see a, a blending. And that blending, that anti-aliasing, um, when you see it normally at 100%, you don't see those little steps. So if I switch now from, it says use device font, so I'm going to switch to, um, oh, it jumped back. Okay, so let me try again. Static text, and let's do another one over here. Let me hit O. 
Big difference, huh? Nice, smooth, clean. Um, and when I zoom in here, even at 400%, let's look at it 800%. Big difference, huh? So this we're going to stay away from. You don't need bitmap types. I don't know that there would be any reason for it other than they give it to you as an option. Okay. So, so to use the text, simply select the T tool. And for right now, we're going to specify just static text. Input text is what you might think. It, you, what you're doing is you're creating a box and it allows the end user to insert type. Dynamic text, on the other hand, it can be, oftentimes can be text that can be placed externally from a server. It's something that can be a little bit more flexible. It's not, once this static text is here, it's just that it's fixed, it's permanent for the end user. Dynamic text isn't necessarily fixed, it's not permanent. It can be, as I said, from a database, you can have text actually be put into it. And when we get to, let's, let me put it this way. <coughs> if I were to use a static text box, like so, <coughs> this is huge. I don't want it 42 point. I'm going to go ahead and make it smaller. because I zoomed in so much, that's why. Okay, when, I ma when I'm done with this text box, um, it's outlined like so, and it looks like nothing is here. Nothing is here. But in ActionScript, I can place text, and when, <coughs> the, um, the when I publish the file, the text, if I, if I program it, will appear in this box. And when I click maybe on it, a slideshow is the best way to do it because I can have this empty box. And every time I click on a different slide, a different piece of text goes into that box. Does that make sense? So that in the text that you have in your action script then, when it goes in that box, in order for it to go in the box, that has to be dynamic text. I'm not explaining it very well other than giving you a good example. Static text, what you would have to do, you would have to have every time you opened a, sl a different slide, <coughs> maybe the text would have to be embedded on that page or it have to have to be embedded on the image or something in order for it to, to appear every time you select it. This is a little bit different. Input text is what you might just might think when you're done. If I were to select, go back to the text box again, and I were to select input text, and I click here, and when I turn off, oh, it's still dynamic? Okay, let me select it again. Let's switch again to input. Okay, when I click here, still input. Okay, let me publish this, and you'll see a difference over here. And it will be available for me to actually type something in, but then you have to add the action script so that when you do type something in and you hit return or whatever, it sends that information to a database. It's like a form box. Yeah, a form box, part of a form box, where you have these little input text boxes. So if I go to window and I go, sorry, control, I'm going to go ahead and test movie. I'll try that. Out. You don't see anything there. Oh, well. You don't see it maybe because I didn't do it right. I should see a little box here for it when I'm done, but I'm not. But you basically get the idea. Now for static text, let me go back again. <coughs> um, for static text, which is what we need at the moment, you have all the fonts that are available on your computer here, which are quite a few. And notice that when you select a particular font, to the left over here, you see a preview of it, which is kind of nice if you're not familiar with the fonts. Okay, which is it's 
actually very nice. And then to the right of that, we have the point size, 20 points. Um, I do have on my website a, a, a videotape lecture on type. And if you're not familiar on how type is measured, it's measured in points and picas. Um, quickly, there are 12 points to a pica. There are six picas to an inch. So that means there's 72 points in an inch. So that gives you a, an idea, a ballpark idea of when uh, it's 20 points, the fraction, you know, the size of it relative to an inch. Okay. We can also can control because so that's what the 20 represents here. 20 points. Um, text fill color. We can also create full bolds, faux italics. Here we can control whether we want it flush left, centered, flush right, or justified. Justified meaning means that it's flush on both sides. <coughs> we also have a little edit paragraph format, which we'll get to in a minute, so we can control if we have a paragraph of type, how we want it to look. This little box here allows us to control the kerning. Kerning is the selective adjustment of space between letters and words. Most of the time you're going to leave it default, but sometimes you'll want letter space. You'll want to ex expand or you'll want it set really tight, so you'll adjust it by yourself here. <coughs> we can also add superscript or subscript if we want here. Okay, everybody know what that is? If I, w if I typed 24 to the third power, I want the third that's up there to be a superscript. Or if I had something that hangs a little bit below, that would be a subscript. <coughs> and as I pointed out here, we can the different kinds of fonts available for us. I'm just going to have um, anti-alias for readability right now, okay? since that's what's important to us at the moment. <coughs> These are not a available right now, but when I have dynamic text, I can specify whether I just want a line of type or I want to automatically wrap or just one line. If I have some text and I want to link it to another website, I can create links here and I can specify a target. I also should click here auto kern that so I don't need to worry about that. <coughs> okay, this is kerning here is set to zero. Well, which letter spacing and auto kerning are similar. <coughs> I believe, I could be wrong, but I think when they talk about letter spacing here, they're talking about tracking, which is that when you have a, a block of text, you can expand the distance or contract the distance uniformly between letters and words. <coughs> Kerning is the selective adjustment of space between letters and words. For the most part, <coughs> and when we use these programs these days, you just let it do its thing, and it's automated. But you'll discover when you have headlines of type or large, bold blocks of text, sometimes it doesn't look quite right. The spacing between letters, while it may mathematically be correct, opt you know, optically doesn't look correct. And so that's where you want to manipulate it and adjust it on your own. Is there a way to manually fit in the Yeah, we can tweak this. So if I come back, for example, I'll go ahead and I'll <coughs> click here. <coughs> I'll type. Um, Now, you'll notice as I'm typing here, it just continues to create a, s a single line. It doesn't jump to the next line, does it? If I just keep typing, 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 it just keeps going, 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 solid line. <coughs> Until I make a text break, like so, or a, a paragraph break. There are different ways of doing this. You can leave them as paragraph breaks, or we can create just a line of text, or we can create a block of text. This is the default button here. I can select this, and I'll watch what happens when I use this. Is as I said, this is equivalent to tracking. Notice how I'm increasing the spacing between the letters and words uniformly. 
<coughs> and I can slide it back, and I can actually have them overlap if I want. Now, <coughs> and when we set to zero, that's just the default setting. <coughs> if I turn off auto sp um, auto kerning, now I got to think to myself because I usually just leave it on here. I'm going to click here on the paragraph for a minute. Um, hmm. Let me click in between here and see if I can't adjust se selectively adjust that. Yeah, see how when I have it turned off, I'm just adjusting the space between individually between these. This is not the best way to work. I would leave the auto features on and use this as tracking unless you really, really feel comfortable with type. There are better tools when you're working in Illustrator and Photoshop, especially Illustrator. Of any program I know, it has the best tools for controlling type. But see, when I have auto kerning turned back on and I select this, it still will allow me to adjust this if I have the cursor placed in one position. But when I select all of it, <coughs> or a portion of it, then it allows me to adjust uniformly. Okay. The letting <coughs> is controlled by selecting the paragraph tab here. But uh, anyway, at the mo I'll, well, when I get to paragraphs, at the moment I just have a block of text, and when I'm done with it, I use the move tool, and I can move it wherever I like. I can go back and I can edit the text. I can change it to another font. I can change the size. I can change the color of it. I, it it's very simple. Just you can double click, and it highlights it. Or I can go back with you know. Go from any other tool and select the text tool, and click on it. And if I just want the first letter to be larger, to be a different typeface, to be whatever, or individual letters or words. I can make them whatever I want. They don't have to be uniform. Um, I can switch this to another typeface. So let's select, um, I don't know, this is probably going to look ho horrible, but Optima. Okay. So that's Optima. And instead of 20 point, let's make it you know, 36. And instead of black, I can click on here and I can make it uh, bright or red. So just as I've adjusted that, I can do the same for all the other letters and words. And it's still a block of text. I could go back and edit it. See, it's still all, all editable, all uniform. Command Z to undo, to go back. But as I said, if um, <coughs> If I want to add additional lines of type, the way I have this set up now, um, I have to put the cursor, I have to select the text tool, put the cursor at the end, and hit the return key. And now I type, you know, this is my second line uh, whoops, of type. Okay? Now, you asked about letting. Letting is the selective adjustment between lines of type. And right now, it looks to me like there's quite a bit of space between them. For readability, it works pretty well. But what if I wanted less space or I wanted more space between lines? <coughs> to do that, we can click on this little, and this little icon here represents the paragraph. Um, it, it's been that way forever, as far as I know. I don't know where it started, but when you click on here, we can adjust the indent automatically. We can adjust line spacing, which is letting. <coughs> and we can adjust the left margin within the text as well as the right margin within the, te within the text box. So if I wish to change the line spacing, at the moment, it's not doing anything because I don't have the lines selected until I, <coughs> if, when I select the type, if I come back here and select both lines, let me cancel this now, and let's select both lines, and I click here, and now when I select this, watch what happens. See how it changes the spacing between them? 
and reduces, and again, I can have some overlap. I can have negative letting if I want. <coughs> they call it line spacing. I call it letting. Letting is actually the correct term. So that's where that's adjusted. When I ad <coughs> adjust the indent, watch what happens. See how that pushes the left over a little bit and increases the size of the box? Uh huh. How do you get to that? Um, you click on this little paragraph awesome. icon. Thank you. The left margin and the right margin, again, are when I increase that, see how there's adjusted space between the text and the edge of the box, and when I select the same for the right margin, see how it adjusts and allows a little bit of extra space? And if you want to delete it, change it, move it, select the Move tool, and it's there. Now, later on, we're going to animate type. And when we start to do work with morphs with shape tweens, we're going to morph between shapes, which is really pretty nifty. And that's a really powerful tool for animation. <coughs> now, if you want a paragraph if, you know, where it automatically scrolls or it automatically, what's the right term, goes to the next line when it reaches the end of the margin. To do that, you select the text tool and you click and drag <coughs> until you get the desired width of the, of the text box. Now when I type inside, and I'm gonna, I'll leave it Optima, but maybe I'm gonna go down to 12 point so it's a little bit smaller. And now I'm just going to type, you know, uh, hold on here. Let me change the paragraph again. And I'm going to set these back to zero, zero, just for the heck of it. <coughs> there we go. Click and drag. So I define the size of my text box. Oh, come on. What am I doing here? Never mind, I didn't have the right text tool selected. Static text, anti-aliasing for readability. Select the desired width, width, and now watch what happens when I type. Let you know when I went to school, huh? Actually, when I went to school, it was just men. Take a typing class, right? And that's one of the practice lines you use. What was the difference between this one and the other one? <coughs> well, now notice that I'm just typing. Sorry. And as soon as it, re it reaches the end of the box, it automatically, wrapping is the term that I wanted to, to use that I couldn't think. It automatically, it auto wraps to the next line. Before, I had to hit the return key, and that's a paragraph break. That's different. So now if I decide, you know what, this is all gibberish, and I highlight it and I delete it, notice it automatically resizes. It wouldn't have done that before. So what did you do before you started? I just started typing. Okay. And there is one significant difference. If I if I'm decide I'm done with this box and I select a new one and I click, I just click here and I type, Notice how it doesn't wrap. And I don't mean musical kind of wrap. You know, like. Uh, so you just have to. You click and drag to size it, and you can always resize it if you want. There is a distinct difference, though, when you look at each of these text boxes, though. Look at this one, and look at this one, and there's a subtle difference. Anybody see it? Hmm? There's a. Huh? If you look in the upper right hand corner with this text box, you notice that the, this is a little square. When I look at this one, it's a circle. What I can do on this one is I can click or double click and it changes it to a single line, which can be kind of a nuisance at times, and I didn't want to do that. <coughs> and now I'm going to use the hand tool. I'm going to go over here for a minute. <coughs> when I 
select again in here. And now when I double click this again, or I click and I drag, rather, notice it changes it back to that box. Same with this one. If I click and I drag, it changes it to a specified size of a text box. When I double click inside, it changes it back to the single line. That, this too is unique to Flash. I don't know of any other program that does that. And um, even as I'm using it now, it feels a little awkward, but it's something worth noting, especially when you want to create a block of text. There is a more efficient way of doing it. And you'll want to do that because, you know, if, you, if you're creating a slideshow, um, or it could be anything, maybe we're, we're creating an ad that's going to be animated, and you want a block of text, and you want it to be set uniformly, then this is a better way to do it, rather than just click here and put your the, the cursor at the very end and hit the return key, and you have separate paragraphs now. That once again, if I type, it just seems all it does is add until I hit a paragraph break again, and they're separate paragraphs. So now, you know, when I if I want to adjust, then I take part of this from here. It adjusts that size, and even if I adjust more, it doesn't auto-wrap. All it does is it makes that line shorter. Does that make sense? When I come in here, if I take from here, see how it automatically wraps and brings up the text? Okay, ready to move on to some animation? Try to do frame by frame animation. <coughs> you you do have somewhat of a feel for the you using the basic tools in in Flash, sort of. Creating boxes and a paintbrush and stuff. Assign gradients to the text? Yes, we can. Um, the only way you can do that though is like other programs, you have to convert it to outlines. At this point in time, while it's editable text, you can only have solid fills. <coughs> if you wish to put a gradient in the type, you have to convert it to an outline, which means that it, you're turning it into non-editable text. That's true in Illustrator as well, and a number of other programs. You have to do that. So, you know, good practice. <coughs> I mean, I didn't talk about gradients the other day, and I do want to talk about them because we're going to be able to animate gradients, and that's when I'll talk about them in greater depth. But if I select right now, and I'll select optimum, we'll make a full bold here, and I'm going to make it really pretty large. Click here. <coughs> and, um, Okay, so right now the only thing I can do is I can highlight it and I can change the colors in here. But if I select a gradient, it doesn't do anything. So what I need to do is I need to convert it to outlines. And when we animate type, we will have to do the same, especially when we want it to morph to something else. So <coughs> what I recommend that everybody do is that you make a copy of this. So what I'll do is I'll hold down the Option key and click and drag and set it over to the side, and you notice it, it just makes a copy of it. Now I can select this one, and I can hit Command-B for Break Apart <coughs> or Modify Break Apart, and you'll notice what it does. It breaks it down into individual letters. Each of these individual letters are editable too, but now it's no longer one word that's editable. It's multiple letters that are editable. I need to break apart one more time. So I'll go and modify again and break apart. Now when I select them, you see the selection mesh? These are no different than the selections or the, the shape objects that we created here. Now with all of these selected, I can select a fill bucket and you'll see that the, the gradient fills inside there. But it's no longer editable. So if I decide later on <coughs> that isn't what I wanted, I have to edit the text, I misspelled or I want to change the font or something, 
I have to delete this and go back to this. And, and again, that's only if you want to put a gradient or a pattern inside or something like that, something other than a solid fill. <coughs> Okay, so that's text. And we will be using a lot of text in here because as you've probably noticed on the web, when you look at ads, there's a lot of text in there, right? And there are most of those ads, almost 100%, near 100% of them are done in Flash. So while that may not be something appealing to you, um, for a number of designers, that's their bread and butter, is to design ads, banner ads. And you can do that quickly and effectively, and it won't take long, and you can generate income from that. For those, that's that an annoying thing, and banner ads have all kinds of shapes and sizes now, and they are specific sizes, default sizes, that when we create a new size from a template, it will give us options. And you do need to adhere to those sizes. Just as if you're designing an ad for a magazine, you have to know the specific size for if it's going to be a full page ad, a half page, quarter page, you know, whatever size it is, they will give you a specific size. And if you don't adhere to that, they're going to crop the image, you crop your ad to fit the size of their page. And the same will be true for this. But again, notice each of these are independent, and if I select that one, I can put a green fill inside that one. So they're all separate now. <coughs> and I'm going to get rid of this. So really before I talk about animation, I need to talk about the timeline again. So as a quick review, for this class, I think it's easiest if we use a frame rate of 20 frames per second. And everybody knows how to change that, right? No, okay. You'll notice up at the bottom of the timeline, it says 20.fps. On yours, it might say 12, which is the default. If I double click on here, oh, come on. Don't crash. It should bring up there we go, document properties, and I can change it here. I can change it back to 10, I can change, or 12, I can change it to 30, I can change it to whatever frame rate I want. <coughs> Again, I'm just gonna leave it at 20. If I want this to, ma to make this my default frame rate, I click make default and I click okay. That will not work here at school, but if you have the program at home, it will, because they have um, a program called Deep Freeze installed on these computers and every time you log out what it does is it resets the computer to a default settings so that you can't mess it up and there was a time a, l a long while in here where you know everybody is a computer expert and they want to customize it and think they're going to make it better and they delete things and move things and mess things up that's why that was put in there Another place to change the, the frame rate is to simply click on the stage, just click. And when you have the property panels down here, you'll, notice that you'll see the frame right here in the upper right hand corner of the, the properties panel. I can highlight this and I can type in the frame rate that I want. Just remember that you can only have one frame rate for an entire project. You can't have multiple frame rates. You can't have on one page a frame rate of 10 frames per second and on another page or in another scene or whatever you want to call it, a separate page rate. It will be the same for the entire move, for the entire project. <coughs> video, if you import a video itself, it will have its own frame rate, but it still it can work independent. Um, it may have changed in a newer version though, but in older versions of Flash, when you imported video, you had to have on your timeline 
the same number of frames that would be populated by the video, and I think that has finally changed. Um, and so that would mean if you had, if you're running at 20 frames per second, and you had three seconds of video, you would have to have at least 60, sec you know, 60 frames in here. I think that's changed, but I don't. I want to wait until we get to that part and then say for sure, especially with the difference between CS3 and 4 now and stuff in video. <coughs> if, you're, if you're generating this file to turn it into a QuickTime movie, then you definitely would want to adjust the frame rate accordingly. If you want it 30 frames per second, then I would do so and then save it as a QuickTime movie, which you can do. And add in that QuickTime movie um, player heads and adjustments and stuff, and then it will try to play at that frame rate. But when you're trying to play it as an SWF movie, it will your computer will only attempt to play it at the frame rate that's embedded in it. <coughs> so if I if you select 30 frames per second, that may work. On the faster computers, it could, may be able to keep up with that and play it, and you'll get a nice smooth um, animation or you know uh, view of your the video that you're trying to play. But with older computers or slower computers, if it can't keep up with that frame rate, it'll start to drop frames, and you'll see kind of a staccato effect. It will stutter, and that doesn't look all that appealing. So, as I've been told, and this has been a little while, but not that long ago, 20, frame, 20, 20 frames per second is a good, it's a, a nice happy medium. And it's also useful for other purposes. As I said, when you're looking at the timeline and you want to gauge how many seconds, it's easier to do it in increments of 10 rather than, say, 12 frames per second or even 24. Because if I wanted something two seconds long, that's 48. Well, if, w I, do I look at 48? No, I look at 50, and then I go back to. That's still, that's two steps. If I say that I want it two seconds and I'm, it's two frames per second, I jump to 40. It's easier to multiply by tens than it is some odd number, right? So that's another practical reason for working at 20 frames per second. 10 frames per second is just too slow. 15 frames per second used to be a standard for CDs, but I think most computers are a lot peppier now, so 20 works pretty good. And 24 actually is for film. And that, I don't remember, I don't know who determined that. Maybe it was Edison, maybe it was somebody after Edison determined that it's 24 frames per second. It's at that point that our eyes can't distinguish between the separate frames, that we see a blend between them, and we see it as continuous movement. And why video came to be at 30 frames per second, anybody know that? I don't know. In Europe, as yeah, PAL, which is the European video, is closer to film. It's 25 frames per second. Why? I don't know. You know. Hmm? It's the Japanese. Yeah, I, I don't know. But that's what they are. You know, it just, it is what it is. <coughs> um, so, looking at the timeline, we have. 20 frames per second. And you'll notice that we, if you scroll over this little thing, this is scroll to playhead. So this is our playhead here. That's what this little, little thing is. But notice that I can't advance it at all. I can't click and drag down in the timeline. Because by default, you only have a one frame movie. And that's it. And with linear animation, you're going to need many more frames. But when we get to Symbols later on, you'll discover if I embed animation in something called a movie clip, which is a type of symbol, it may look on the main frame or the main timeline that there's one frame, but embedded in that movie clip will be multiple frames. And it, you may only need a, on your main timeline, 
one frame to play a whole thing, a whole movie. But for right now, with linear animation, I can't scrub ahead or past because I only have one default frame. And you'll notice on this on frame one that it is highlighted and it's a little bit, there's a little white dot in it. Everybody see the little white dot? <coughs> that means that that is a blank keyframe. Okay. First important concept, what is a keyframe? A keyframe denotes in animation something, a, a change is taking place. In traditional animation, it could be something as simple as moving something from point A to point B. Well, you have the starting point, point A, that's a keyframe. The end point is point B. All of the frames in between that create the illusion of that movement are called tweens. And they're just populated frames. But where the significant change takes place at the beginning and the end are, in fact, where you place your keyframes. Okay? So that's what a keyframe is. If I were to animate my arm going back and forth. If it's pivoting here, everything else is static and I'm just moving back and forth. And it's rotating like so. So I would have a keyframe here and a keyframe here. And if, I, if it went back again, I could have a keyframe here and a keyframe here. Those were the significant changes. Everything in between is just simply a populated frame and it's consi those are called tweens or in-betweens. In traditional animation, you have your animators, and what they do is they just draw the keyframes, and that's it. <coughs> you have your newbies, your neophytes, the people that are new to animation, the underlings, and what they do, or they used to do, and they still do, is they would draw all the in-betweens. <coughs> What we will do with frame-by-frame frame animation is we're going to do one frame at a time. And you can still do that. If you look at the early animations, on uh, television animations that you will see on, um, we're still computer generated on um, what's MTV, or really kind of herky-jerky, those were frame-by-frame frame animations. That each separate frame was drawn. The traditional Disney animations are frame-by-frame frame animation. Every separate frame is drawn. Okay. In the com <coughs> Stop action refers to taking something in the 3D world, <coughs> you know, like um, <coughs> having this pen and wanting it to appear to move around the room. Stop action, then, you have your video camera, and there's different kinds that they have, or film, that um, you focus and the, the, the camera is static. <coughs> and then what you'll do is, is that you take it and you take one frame. And then I move it just a little bit, and then I take the second frame, and then I move it a little bit, and I take the third and the fourth, and then when you play it back at 24 frames per second, it looks like it's moving around the room. So when you talk about stop action or claymation or things like that, that's how that's done. Anybody like Wallace and Gromit? Yeah, yeah that's how that's done. Very tedious. Or um, <coughs> Tim Burton's um, The Night Before, Nightmare Before Christmas. Is that it? Um, there's a bunch of them that are, I mean, really s spectacular. Uh, those guys have the patience of Job that do that. You know, think about how smooth it is, and they, they just move these things in just teeny tiny little increments. I mean, they might get a second or two or three done a day, and that's it. You know, figure 24 frames a second, it's a lot. <coughs> what we will eventually take advantage of in here, though, is that we'll, it will automatically create tweens for you, and that's the power of computers, of 3D as well as 2D, that you don't have to draw the in-betweens. It does that for you and does a very nice job of it. But just to get a feel for it, we're going to do <coughs> today frame-by-frame frame animation. So 
you understand the concept of what a, a keyframe is. Now, what is a blank keyframe? In Flash, a blank keyframe, and I don't know of any other program that talks about blank keyframes, but a blank keyframe is simply a placeholder in time. If you have a blank keyframe, that means that nothing is there on the stage. It's just empty. It's, it's holding, the, holding there for time. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, so <clears throat> if I take my brush, for example, <coughs> and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have a red fill. <coughs> Everybody knows how to add a red fill, and I don't want any stroke. <coughs> and what I'll do is I'm just going to animate my name, and it's going to look pretty cruel, crude. So I'll go ahead and um, let's make sure I have a nice big brush here. And I just want round brush shape, and that looks pretty good. So I'll go ahead and I'll click, like so, and drag, and I make my K. <coughs> Notice that that white is now gone. As soon as something enters the frame, whether it's off stage or not, that becomes a keyframe, not a blank keyframe. Okay. <clears throat> now I can jump and I can click to the next point in time. It's not populated yet. And what I can do is I can insert a number of different kinds of frames. <clears throat> so if I go to insert timeline, I can insert a frame <clears throat> which keeps the K on there for an extended period of time. I can add another keyframe, and what that will do, the, a, a keyframe, is that it will it goes back in time where the last keyframe was and it copies it. Or I can insert a blank keyframe. And when I insert a blank keyframe, it's not that the other one has disappeared, <coughs> because if I scrub now and I go back in time, it is there at that point in time. But when I scrub forward to this place in time, I have created a placeholder. <coughs> okay, So you have to decide what kind of animation do you want. Okay, um, What I might think of doing, if I want, if I was, uh, let me try it three different ways. Um, I want it to look like I drew my first letter in the name, and then the second, and then the third, and you just see them appear much the same way that you would if, some, if I were typing it. So I'm going to go back, <coughs> and instead of the, I'm going to undo this. So I'm hitting Command Z, <coughs> and now I'm clicking the second frame as I did before, but this time I'm going to insert a keyframe. And if you scrub back and forth, they're identical. Because as I said, when you insert a keyframe, it goes back in time, looks at the last keyframe, and makes a copy of it. So now, <coughs> excuse me, when I click on frame two, and I <coughs> add my I, now watch when I scrub back and forth. See, it starts with here, with a K. I add the I in time, and then I'm going to repeat the same thing. I'm going to add a keyframe, and it will now copy the K and the I. So I'll insert timeline, keyframe, and now I'll add the R. Now when I scrub through, Okay, see how we're gradually, it will be animated. And now I can once again click frame four, insert timeline, keyframe, and I'll add the last K. And again, if it looks really crude the way I'm doing it, that's just fine. Now I want to see what this looks like when it plays at 20 frames per second. I can hit the return key. And I'll get a sense of what it looks like when it plays. But to get a real sense of what this project looks like, 
I need to publish it. And there are a couple of ways that I can do that. I can go to File, and I can say Publish. Or an easier way of doing that <coughs> would be to go to Control, Test Movie, or hit Command Return, or Apple Return. And it will, it's another form of publishing the SWF file. Wherever your file is saved, it will publish it. And that's the one that you would put up on the internet, right? So if I go to File, Save As, and I'm just going to name this one um, Kirk Annum. <coughs> Why? I don't know. Um, I want to make sure that this is on my desktop. You can save yours on your flash drive if you wish. <coughs> now when I go, go to Control, Test Movie, or I hit Command, Return, it publishes it and see what it looks like. Now notice because what it does. It, it just plays again and again and again and again. And because the first frame was already populated with a K, that doesn't disappear, does it? It's, it looks like it's constant, and it is. It's constantly there. It's there on every frame. <coughs> so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back, and even though this is frame by frame, every frame is separate. Every frame, you know, it's distinct. But when you play it, it we see the animation now. And you'll also notice with Flash, by default, it loops. It plays from one through your last your last frame, and it automatically goes back and just keeps playing and playing and playing. You have to add action script to tell it to stop. So let me now try some different things and see if I don't goof up and make sure that maybe I want the K to disappear so that they all come on and they all go off. To do that, at the very beginning, I probably should have had a blank keyframe so that I had that as a placeholder in time first. So what I can do now is I can insert timeline blank keyframe, and that's not what I wanted. To do. What did I do? Let me undo that. Let me click again, insert timeline blank keyframe, and it didn't work, so let me undo. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a different. I'm going to do something a little bit differently, and this takes a bit of work to understand how to select frames and move them. So uh, what I want to do is I want to select all the frames to be able to move them down in the timeline. There's a couple of ways that I can do that. I can just click on the layer and notice that they're all selected. Another way is to click and drag, and it's one fell swoop. It's not click release and click and drag. It's click and drag. And then I can move, come over here and I can move it ahead one frame. And by moving it one frame, you'll notice that it placed the, it, it frame one is a placeholder, a blank keyframe. Okay, let me undo and let's do it a different way. I can click on the layer and again, all of them are selected and then I move and click and drag it ahead one, and you'll see I have a blank keyframe here. That's what I want. Now let me publish it again, and let's see what it looks like. So I'll hit Command, Return. Now you'll see the K flicker, because it hits frame one, and frame one is a blank keyframe. The next thing that I might want to do is decide, you know what, this is playing too fast. I need to slow it down. If you're, I mean, I could always change, if this is all that I had, I could change the frame rate. So what I, I mean, I can do that now. I can click on the, on the, the selection tool, click on the background, and let's change it to 10 frames per second. And then let's hit Command, Return, and that slows it down. Now, if I think that's still too fast, change it to five frames per second. But remember that if I have additional animation in my project, 
I can only have five frames per second, and that might look horrible. You know, that just may not work. So maybe there's another way that I can do this. <coughs> Let's go ahead and I'm going to put it back to 20 frames per second. And I guess I should show it at 30 frames per second so you can see that as an example. And let some um, control test movie. Now it really plays fast. Okay. So I'm going to switch back to 20 frames per second, but I'm going to slow it down. Whoops. A little bit differently. I'm going to add space between each frame. And I'm just going to add frames, not blank keyframes, not keyframes. I'm just going to add frames. So all it's doing is it's saying that this keyframe, that nothing is changing within these, this group of frames. And there are, keys, there are keyboard equivalents for all of these. Again, I can go to Insert, Timeline, and I can select Frame or hit F5. And you'll notice what happens. See the little square there? And if I hit F5 again and again and again, you'll see that this blank keyframe now stays on the stage for a total of five frames or one quarter of a second. If I hit Command, Return, See how there's a, a significant pause at the beginning? Should probably even make it more pronounced. Hit F5 again. I'm going to do it for a total of <coughs> 20 frames. Hit Command. Look at that. For one second, it pauses and then plays. So I've slowed it down by adding frames to it. I'm going to go back several steps. And then I'm going to select each keyframe and I'm going to do the same thing to add populated frames between each of them so that it, it stays for a short period of time rather than hurry up and jump to the next change. The ne next change meaning a keyframe. So again, I'll hit F5, or if you forget F5, just go select the, the frame to which you want to add additional frames. And I go to Insert, Timeline, Frame. But that gets kind of tedious to keep going up and doing that. So just hit F5. And now I select the next keyframe, and I do the same thing. And I hit F5. And I click the next keyframe and I hit F5 several times until it matches, the, you know, maybe four or five times. Hit F5. Okay, now watch when I play it. Again, five or four keyframes because there are only four times, or five, there are five keyframes. There's one blank keyframe, which is a placeholder for a quarter of a second. And each of these additional keyframes are when something significant changes. Now when I play it, Command, Return, see how it slowed down considerably? And maybe it go, hey, this is what I was going for. This looks pretty good. So this is what you'll be doing pretty often. You'll be creating, if you're going to do frame by frame, or even if you're not, if you add um, tweens in between to make things move, <coughs> you'll want to create the first, the last, and then decide what's going to happen in between. Now I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but what I want to show you at the moment is how to, notice that I've placed everything in the upper right hand corner. What if I wanted to center all of this? How do you move an animation afterwards? Because remember, this is not like Illustrator or Photoshop where it's static for one frame. This is multiple images over time. Does that make sense? So I have to move all of this time 
in order for it to move uniformly. If I just take one of these and I move this over like so, I've only changed it at that point in time. So now watch what happens when I hit Command Return. See, it didn't move the whole, you know, I mean, I'm not moving the whole thing. And are you going to move each one independently? And I go, oh, okay, well, I'll do that. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll move this one too. But it only moves it at that point in time. So now when I do that, so that doesn't help me. That, that gets very awkward. I want to move the whole thing a unit in time. <coughs> so now what we're going to do is pay attention to these little widgets up here. Let me see how I'm doing on time for my video so I can um, gauge how much more I'm going to record today. I have 25 minutes left. That's enough time. <coughs> okay, the first little widget here is onion skin. When I click on that, <coughs> notice that I can go back in time. I can click on this little widget at the top. And I really don't see much taking place, but if I go back in time over here, uh, I'm not going to see because I don't have any movement. There we go. You can see what, even though I've scrubbed back in time here, if I click the widget here, you'll notice that I see what's going to happen in time in the future. See how it's grayed out, like looking through tracing paper? That's what the onion skin is. If I want to see this just an outline form, except for this first frame, this is what the future frames are going to look like. See how they're outlined in green? This one is the one that we're going to cover. This is edit multiple frames, and this is tricky. Okay. So I'm going to select Edit Multiple Frames, and you'll notice that when I select this, it looks this little widget at the top looks very similar to the onion skinning widget. Does everybody see that? Because I can control the number of frames that I want to see in onion skinning, and I can also control the number of frames that I want to move in time, multiple frames. In this particular instance, I want to select all of the frames in my timeline, and I want to edit them. Okay, so I select them all, like so. And then it's the first step. You have to select Edit Multiple Frames, and you select them all. And then you come down to your stage, and you click, and it looks like nothing is selected, and I select Command A for Select All. And it selects it again from the stage. And now I can move this in time, and I can center it. That's where I want it. And then when I'm done moving it, I can deselect <coughs> these. And now I hit Command Return. And notice how it's been repositioned. All of them have been repositioned. So that enables me now to edit multiple frames. Let me do um, one more quick one that um, utilizes onion skinning as you're creating an illustration. Okay, so that you can see what you've drawn in the past and build upon that. Okay, so I'm going to go File New, Action Script Tree. Let's create a brand new file. So this will be um, um, onion skinning. So I'll just File, Save As. I haven't done anything yet, but Onion Skin. <coughs> so let's say I wanted to create the illusion that I'm drawing pieces of something. And I wanted to make sure that when I drew them that everything matched up. So what I can do is I can, um, let's start 
fine. Let's just, this is going to be crude, but you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm going to start with a brush tool. <clears throat> and I'm going to just start, I'm going to make a box. So I'll go ahead and I'll click and I'll drag like so. And then I go to the next frame and I insert timeline <clears throat> blank keyframe. But I want to see what I have done in the past because I want to build on this. So I turn on onion skinning and notice that I can see that where I've drawn before. So now I can click from here to here and I can draw that. So I know that the end of this matches that, right? If I had that turned off, I wouldn't know where that matches. Turn it back on and now I go again and I can insert timeline blank keyframe, but notice I can see where this matches. So now I click and drag again at this point Okay, and now I can do the same. I'm going to go ahead and insert, I click the next point in time, insert timeline, blank keyframe. Now I can, see, no, now notice that I can only see the last two. That's really, uh, in some cases that's all you need, but I need to know where it, it um, it's where I'm going to start here and where to end here. So I'm going to go ahead and click this little widget so that I see all of it. And I can click and drag so that it ends at that point. Now I'm going to do it one more time. So I'm going to insert, click the next frame, insert timeline, blank keyframe. I want to make sure I see all of it. And now I'm going to make a box, a completed box. So click and drag so that it pretty closely matches. As I said, this is pretty crude. It's not perfect, but at least I know it's pretty much in the same position. Not, you know, close enough, as I say, for government work. <coughs> Works okay. So now let's go ahead and turn off onion skinning. Now I'm going to go ahead and play it and let's see what it looks like. And it's flying really fast. But what I could do is slow it down. So to do the same thing that I had done before, I can select all of these, move them in time. I have a blank keyframe. Now each of these, I can hit F5 four times, two, three, four. <coughs> Click the next one, hit F5, one, two, three, four. Select the next one, hit F5, one, two, three, four. Select the next one. One, two, three, four. And select the last one. One, two, three, four. So it stays there <coughs> for several frames. Now let's hit Command, Return, test it again. But notice how they all match up. That's the whole point of using onion skinning. So that if you're doing frame by frame animation, or if you're not, they all match up pretty nicely. I know where the beginnings and the endings are. And that's when you're drawing frame by frame animation, you need to see through. And with traditional animators, when they're drawing, when those guys are drawing to go from one to the next, <coughs> they have the paper, you know, like five pieces of paper between their fingers here. And they're flipping back and forth and flipping back and forth so they can see. And I don't know how they do it, but they manage to do it. But here it's doing it for us. It's allowing to see in digital space back in time. That's what the onion skinning did. There's other examples that I can do too, where you know you can have an arrow move in time and stuff, but, and there are better ways of doing that, but that's just a good example of that. One last thing that I think should be worked that we're, we can start to apply tweens now. <coughs> You're going to want to have something automated. And I hope I do this quick enough, and if I, even if I don't, um, I want to make sure I get it on videotape. So uh, there are different kinds of tweens. <coughs> there are only two kinds, but there are different kinds. There are shape tweens, and there are motion tweens. Because we have not used symbols yet, we're not going to use motion tweens. We're going to use a shape. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to morph from a square to a W. Okay? Why? Because I can. Why not? So I'll go File, New. <coughs> And I'm going to create shape. Um, this new one, I guess I didn't name. This will be my shape tween. So anytime you use the tweening features, you have to ask yourself two things. What do I want to take place? And number two, how long do I want it? You know, over what span of time do I want it to take place? Okay. So what I want it to do is I want it to morph from a square to a W, and then I have to ask myself over what span of time do I want it to happen? Well, because I'm not sure, I'm going to use my default rule of thumb of one second. Okay, so this is what I do. I start with the square, with the, the, um, the first frame, and I'm going to select my rectangle tool, and I'm going to make a nice red box here, like so. Okay. And I want this to turn into a W. So then I have to say to myself, I want it to turn into a W, and I want it to take place over one second. So I'm going to go to frame 20, <coughs> and I'm going to insert in the timeline a blank keyframe as a placeholder, because this is where I'm going to put my W. But I, the, the, the box goes away. How, where am, how am I going to know where to put that box? I turn on onion skinning. Right? So now on this frame, I can select the, the W key, <coughs> or the, the, the type tool, and I'm going to click here, and in black, because I want it morphed to black, and I want it bold, and I'm probably going to increase the skies even more. I want to type my W. Oops, there, come on. Okay. I should probably use another typeface. I'm kind of hedging here. Um, something that's really nice and bold. Um, huh? I was going to use impact here. That's a nice, this impact is a nice one. Okay. <clears throat> and if I want to transform this, I can and make it even bigger. And if I want to make it bigger yet, I can. That's what this tool is here, the transform tool. Because I want it, the edges to pretty much match what I have here. I guess this will be fine for right now, and you'll see. And I want to center this up so it looks pretty centered. But what I have to do in order to, to morph one to the other is that I have to convert the W to an outline, so that means I need to break apart. I can't use editable text to morph this. So what I'm going to do is, with the text selected, I'm going to modify and select Break Apart, or hit Command-B. Turns it into editable text, doesn't it? Now when I turn off the onion skinning and I play this, it's not going to morph, but you'll see what happens. The square stays on stage for 19 frames, and it suddenly, for a brief 1 20th of a second, you see the W. That's not what I want. But I have my keyframes, the beginning and the end. So how do I create a smooth transition in between? Well, I just click anywhere in the timeline in between. And when I've selected the timeline, you'll notice in my properties panel, I have, since it knows I have a frame selected, it wants me to select tween. And I click from here, and I select shape. The only time you use shape tweens is when you have shape objects, and you see that selection mesh. And now what I can do is that now notice that the timeline changes to green and I see this solid arrow. Now I know I have a tween. Now when I go ahead and I play it, 
but it still isn't quite working the way I want it. It's taking from the lower right hand corner and it's bending it up. So I want a, sm a, a different kind of a smoother transition. What I can do is I can add something called shape hints, which help me control how this thing is going to morph. So to do that, I modify <coughs> and I transform, no, wait a minute, I can't remember myself. Shape, there we go. Modify shape, add shape hint. And you'll see in the middle of my square, a little red A, that is a little control point. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it up here in the left-hand corner. And then I'm gonna go to the next keyframe and I'm gonna move it in the upper left-hand corner. And you'll notice it changes to green. It went from red to green. That means it's now working. Now what I can do is I can scrub through here. And it doesn't look too different, but it is controlling that top left-hand corner. Now I want to do the same for the other corner. Huh? Um, pull it off and put it back on. It, sometimes it takes a little bit of work. Do, do the first one first. The, f the first frame, move it, and then, there you go, and then select the second one, there you go, now it will work. <coughs> now I can do the same thing, I can add as many as I want, more isn't necessarily better, but one, two, three, modify, shape, add shape hint, or shift command H, now I have B, there's a second one, so I'm going to move that one up there, click to the end and I'm going to move this one up here. So that controls that. That goes to that corner. Now I can scrub through it to see how it moves. And that's better. That's how I want it. Now that's nice. I mean it is a nice, it's really nice animation. And you can do some fun things. I mean you can create some, you know, your, let your imagination run. You can um, morph shape, you know, any kind of shape to any other kind of shape, and you can get some really interesting effects. Why do you think we do not use the greater power? Say again? Why do you think we do not use the greater power? It won't do it. You'll see a broken, you'll see a broken line here. It won't, it'll see that you're trying to apply the tween. I know I'm running out of time, so on Tuesday I'll review and we'll show you what happens when you select a motion tween when you should have selected a shape tween. And if you don't use break apart, you use the wrong features, what will happen? How do you delete the, uh, how do you delete the shape? How do I delete what? Shape hints, how do I get rid of them? Um, you can, let me close this, and you can go to modify, or I'm sorry, yeah, modify. Wait a minute, why can't, let me go ahead and select the object, or select a, a keyframe. Go to modify, shape, and why can't, let me go ahead, I should be able to come back here. Let me just select the whole thing. Modify, shape, and then I can select remove, sh remove all hints. But you have to select the whole thing. And I wouldn't have remembered that until I tested it just a second ago. So just click on the layer, all of it selected, or if you don't, click and drag to highlight both keyframes between which we have the tween, and then go to modify, shape, remove all shape hints. Now if I want this to hold after it's animated, and I want to see the final product for a while, I just need to add frames, right? Just as I had done before. So select, click on that last frame, and hit F5 several times, or if I know that I want it to sustain that for maybe another second, or let's say two <laughs> seconds, click the frame that you, you know, at that end point, go ahead and hit F5, and it adds populated frames from 20 all the way through 60. Now when I hold Command, I hit Return, it morphs, and it will hold for two seconds, and it will repeat again. Notice what's also morph, what's also changing over time. It's blending from red to black. What if I 
came back here and I selected the, the W and I changed it to green. Let's change it to a darker green. And I hit command return. Notice that it's morphing not only the shape, but it's transitioning and animating the color as well. You're, if I scrub through this, notice that uh, it's blending the colors in between as well. And if I had changed size over time, if I had changed um, position over time, if I had changed alpha or transparency over time, it would change all of those too. It automatically morphs all of those properties. Now, when we eventually get to CS4, there is going to be another little panel underneath properties that will give you, when you've added a morph, all of the properties that you can change. It will also show you little diagrams of the transition from one to the other. So without coming up here and changing those, they can all be changed from the properties panel down here. But that's for another day when we get CS4. So we've worked with some basic shapes, we've worked with type today, and we've started, worked with a, a, a frame by frame animation, and we've also now created a tween, and we've morphed or tweened, you know, from one shape to another. Now I use type, remember, for one of my shapes, but in order to use that type with the shape tween, I had to hit command B or modify break apart in order to convert that editable text to a shape, to be able to use the shape object. Had I not done that, I would have seen a broken arrow here, a little dotted line, which shows that I'm trying to apply a shape tween, but there's something wrong. The other thing I should probably, the last thing I want to mention too, is that if there are multiple things animating on stage at any given time, you can only have one tween on a layer at any given time. So all of the other things would have to be on separate layers. There are workarounds for that. You have to put that animation inside symbols, but we'll get that to that on another day. And those symbols then can reside on the same layer, but anyway. So if you'd like, now would be a good time to take a little break. We can come back and then you can give at a, um, try to 